Can the electric grid handle EVs? This is the decade old question that has aroused so many engineers, project managers, and investors about whether or not this technology that we've all been so passionate about is actually going to cause more damage to the average consumer than benefit. Now, don't get me wrong, EVs in the short term are a fantastic push. This is exactly what we need to push towards that 100% renewable energy future. And this is exactly what's going to stir up investment in this space from OEMs and new startups. But given the pace of adoption we've seen from companies like Tesla and even some of the OEMs in this internal combustion engine space, it's important for us to understand whether or not these vehicles can be sustained by the aging and rather unreliable modern electric grid. And that question is exactly what I want to address in this video. But as usual, guys, before we get into it, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Now, to start things off, if you guys want to know the answer to the question whether or not the electric grid can handle EVs, the answer is yes. We have plenty of electricity that is produced on an annual basis here in the US to support electric vehicle charging for millions of EVs, and we have a runaway for that for the next five years. But the reality is that's not the question we really care about. The question as investors and engineers that we really care about is can the electric grid handle the dynamic loads that electric vehicles will add? And well, what exactly do I mean by dynamic loads? Well, as you all know, an electric vehicle can be charged at home at different power ratings and also at your nearest supercharger. But that is obviously not the case for internal combustion engine vehicles, which are often charged at centralized gas stations operated by big oil companies. Because of the decentralization that EVs provide, these vehicles can be charged in a much more customizable fashion, meaning there are more variables that grid operators need to consider before adding investments. Now, if you just look at consumption in the US, we produce more electricity than we actually use by a big amount. As you can see, that gap has been growing since 1990, and this is mostly due to the large amounts of energy storage we have and the renewable energy penetration into the overall energy mix. Renewable energy obviously is intermittent, meaning you can't really control the electricity that it produces. So when the demand for power is low from a certain city, that electricity that's produced has basically been wasted, meaning it is excess power. And so really this problem around EV charging is not a problem about the amount of energy we consume, it's about the power that these vehicles demand at any given time. As we all know, the electric grid is an instantaneous network. When you plug something into your wall outlet at your house, instantly that electricity needs to be supplied from a power generation facility. Virtually electrons travel at the speed of light, so there is a very direct connection between the power generation facility hundreds of miles away and the little port that you have your laptop plugged into. This obviously means that the power that you're using has to be instantaneously produced by a power plant hundreds of miles away and managed in such a way that it does not disrupt and overload the supporting mechanisms on the grid. Those supporting mechanisms are electrical substations, transformers, and even energy storage facilities that are always rated at a certain voltage. And most grid operators design these electric grids to transmit energy in a manner that does not offset power from other facilities when demand comes online. Now, this is obviously okay for houses and commercial facilities, which have a very consistent pattern that utilities have come to recognize over the past 100 years. Obviously, these are stationary houses and their loads tend to follow a seasonal pattern throughout the day and throughout the year. But when it comes to electric vehicles, people have very different usage patterns for such kinds of cars. They can charge them during the day, during the morning, or during the middle of the night. It doesn't matter. As a result, electric grid companies need to be able to supply the massive amounts of power that most Tesla superchargers or even at-home kilowatt chargers require. 
The difference between operating a microwave or a fridge and an electric vehicle is that an electric vehicle is actually a storage mechanism, meaning it needs multiple kilowatts of energy supply for extended durations to fill up the juice of the battery. Whereas a microwave or any high power appliance within your house will obviously require a very small amount of power for a very minimal amount of time. And that right there is the true problem we need to solve for wide scale adoption of electric vehicles. This isn't a problem for the short term because adoption is only three to 5% in the US today. And the electric grid has plenty of energy storage coming online to support these vehicles. But as people demand faster charging solutions that require north of 300 kilowatts of power, you're gonna need more energy storage, you're gonna need more grid upgrades, and you're gonna need more supporting software to manage the power from the grid. As you can see, according to the Boston Consulting Group, as the penetration of electric vehicles rises as a percentage of overall sales in a country, it is expected that the retail prices that you and I as a consumer and businesses face is potentially going to rise at an exponential fashion. This is obviously because the more load you require from the grid, the higher the cost of that electricity because of the R&D and transmission upgrades required. And as you can see, per EV that comes on the road by 2030, it is expected that in a non-optimized way, the total transmission and distribution investments that your average US utility would require would be around $5,800 per electric vehicle on the road. Now, for those wondering what's the difference between non-optimized and optimized, the simple difference is that optimized uses technologies like V2G and energy storage and load management technologies in the IoT space to better supply and produce electricity. Meaning potentially as a consumer, you could use your electric vehicle as a supply to the grid and sell the electricity back to operators, whereas the operators can decide when the peak demands are low and give you cheaper rates for your vehicles. But obviously, because we're not even anywhere close to reaching the scale of integrating optimized technologies and IoT infrastructure, we need to look at the non-optimized way and the cost that that incurs for the grid, because that's the trend that we're going to be facing for at least the next 20 to 30 years. That is obviously until U.S. households on average have more electric vehicle sales than gasoline sales. But obviously, higher costs are not the only problem for higher demand on the grid. Power failures are also a deadly and extremely costly event that are happening way too often in such a digitally connected world. We saw two extreme cases of this happening in California and Texas in 22 and 21. And although the causes of the failures in both of these scenarios were different, they both shed light on the opportunity and the fallback of EV adoption. For example, in Texas, the root cause of their failure was because of their power generation equipment actually freezing because of the record cold temperatures. They have a mix of natural gas peaker plants and coal power plants that produce their baseload electricity with wind, nuclear, and solar energy, accounting for around 25% of their total energy mix. According to the research conducted by the Texas government and independent parties, it was shown that actually all types of these power generation sources ended up failing because of the high temperatures. Now, this is obviously a problem with the technology itself, not necessarily a problem with the demand, but it does go to shed light on the opportunity of more energy storage for the grid. Energy storage essentially means you're storing electricity that was not used for times when it's going to be in high demand. And electric vehicles form the perfect form for such energy storage. The more EVs we have on the road in Texas, the more vehicle to grid technologies that have been integrated into households, the more households could actually have their power restored in such an outage. However, when you switch sides and look over at what happened in California, the coins are completely flipped. In California, the real problem arises from a record demand of energy from the heat waves that was occurring in the state at that time. Even though California has a ridiculous amount of renewable energy and energy storage on the grid, they were not able to keep up with the insane demand for AC and cooling systems in the state. 
And as we all know, California is the highest EV ownership state in the entire world, meaning the electric grid faced extra challenges from EV owners trying to charge their vehicles after coming back from work or during massive road trips. And that added extra loads to the grid, which technically could have helped avoid some local area blackouts if the power demand instantaneously surpassed 2 to 3 megawatts, because that is typically the rated power of most local substations. And as a matter of fact, because California is trying to phase out their natural gas and fossil fuel plants, they have an even higher demand for better grid stability because of the problems faced by renewable energy. Because renewable energy produces DC current and it obviously is intermittent, it requires extra investments in energy storage and requires even more grid upgrades for times when power might be too high or too low. And it's abundantly clear that the grid is simply not ready there to supply peak demand days with the amount of electric vehicles that are already on the road and the lack of back-end infrastructure. But now just imagine what will happen when you have vehicles like the Tesla Semi coming on the road that typically charge at 10 times the power rating of your average Tesla Model 3. Now this is where the problem really starts to exponentialize when it comes to understanding grid failures. Trust me, when it comes to regular electric vehicles that are charged at home at 2-3 to three kilowatts, that is not going to cause a problem for the grid. The real problem arises from heavier duty vehicles that not only hold more energy on them, meaning they need to capture more load from the grid, but their peak power demand is also magnitudes higher than what the current grid is facing with Teslas and other EVs. And I think this is where the uncertainty really starts to set into play. We simply don't have enough of these vehicles on the road to truly understand their issues, but because of the fact that Tesla is touting their one megawatt charger for charging just one truck in 30 minutes, we all know the cost implications of that could be very heavy, for not only customers, but also the grid. Even if theoretically all Tesla Semi owners were to charge their vehicles overnight, it would still add more cost to your retail prices from a baseload perspective and also harm the grid if they were to be charged during the day. Because most operators in the trucking space can't really stand waiting more than one hour to refill their vehicle, they're going to have to be invested in their Tesla mega charger system, which obviously is going to cost more than $1 million and potentially months to site and permit. And that obviously doesn't even account to the fact that a typical electric vehicle charging station will be able to serve a lot less vehicles per day than an equivalent gas or hydrogen station. That's because charging takes at best more than five times the amount of time at 30 minutes compared to five minutes to fill up your tank, meaning that each charging station is going to have a magnitude less return on investment every year compared to a gasoline or even a hydrogen fueling station. That obviously is very bad for companies that might want to buy such projects in the face of big heavy duty vehicles. And so even though in many ways the decentralization of renewable energy is a great thing, it also creates problems for consumers and for the price volatility of electricity. Because at an estimated $200,000 for installation costs of six Tesla superchargers, you could start building an equivalent gasoline station from complete scratch and have a higher and faster return on your investment because obviously electric cars are simply not up there with the amount of cars that sell from gasoline. That is exactly where I see the hurdles for EV charging. Not necessarily in your average consumer plugging in at home, but more in the heavier duty applications when it comes to external charging. As I've showed you in this video, the electric grid is designed to handle power loads from your households in distribution networks. But when it comes to higher loads in more dynamic areas, we have a lot of uncertainty about the grid. And as we've all seen with what's happened in California, there is problems with demand and pricing. But as usual, guys, this is just my opinion. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below.